Good blessed, good morning. Glory to God for another day that we come together so that we will worship God in spirit and in truth. And I just want to make mention, I um, want to thank everybody for all your prayers. I appreciate all of you. Mwah, mwah, chup, chup. Thank you for the love. Thank you for the, uh, the prayers. Um, the surgery went well. Glory to God for his grace and love. And um, I'm 100% okay. <laughs> Amen. So, yeah, my heart is full of joy because of your love, because of God's grace. Um, for so many years in our lives, God has been with us, and Lord willing, He will be with us, and we will be with Him until the last of our breath. Now today, um, many Christians around the world are celebrating what is traditionally called Easter Sunday, okay? uh, which basically is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is a reminder for us of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. Remember that Jesus sacrificed himself for you and I, okay? And um, uh, last week, I called this the uh, final act of Jesus, his uh, grand display of power, his grand display of authority. And um, since this is observed around the world, uh, this is good because uh, the message of the cross and the empty tomb, they are being uh, brought to the knowledge even to those non-believers. You know? And uh, since the world is celebrating the Easter Sunday, non-believers you know, will be able to see from our perspective, why there is such a celebration. And who knows, Lord willing, they will be converted as well. Right? Now, uh, but for us Christians, a call to remember the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this is not just a yearly observation. This is not just a yearly celebration. You know, because we remember Jesus' sufferings, we remember his death, we remember his resurrection every Sunday. Just a while ago, led to us by Brother Ed Rivera, you know, the partaking of the bread and the uh, fruit of the vine, which enable us to remember this wonderful act of grace and this ultimate act of sacrifice made by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, it tells us that it is a command for us to do, as we have heard from the scripture readings uh, through Brother Ed a while ago. Now, the message of the cross is as important as the message of the rolled stone and the empty tomb, because the message of the cross you know, uh, it talks about his death, his resurrection, and the uh, empty tomb, the rolled stone represents, it talks about Jesus' resurrection. Now for the cross, you know, the death of Jesus Christ, which is the forgiveness of our sins. John 3.16, and the rolled stone and the empty tomb represents Jesus' resurrection, his power over death. Now, if you will just go through that message, his power over death, it speaks of your salvation. It speaks of my salvation. Now, it means if we remain faithful, if you remain faithful to God, you know, we will be resurrected with him and be with him in heaven. 
John 11, 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. You know, both events, the crucifixion and the resurrection, it manifests and it validates Jesus' claim of his deity. His claim being the Son of God. His claim being God. His divine nature being God. It also validates the Old Testament prophecies regarding Jesus Christ, regarding him, okay, that he would be crucified, and on the third day, he would be resurrected. Now, given these facts in front of you, the cross, the death of Jesus Christ, which is the forgiveness of our sins, and the empty tomb, which is the resurrection of the body of Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and our resurrection ultimately. Now my question is, how do you see all these facts in the light of your life? How do you see the resurrection? How do you see the cross? How do you see the empty tomb of Jesus Christ? Now a few weeks ago, we, we talked about a series of lessons about choices. And the most important choice you and I must make is where would I want to spend my eternity? Okay. That is the most important decision, the most important choice, the most important question that you must answer in your heart. Where would I want to spend my eternity? The lesson for this morning is your way to eternal life. I want each and every one of us, especially those who have not yet come to terms in Jesus Christ, who have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to open your heart. I want you to open your eyes, your mind, your whole being to this lesson. Because at the end, Jesus is talking about your soul. The, the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection represents a choice. When I look at the cross, when I look at the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, it represents a choice. And that choice I took many years ago. When I saw the resurrection, when I saw the cross, it tells me that Jesus Christ loved me so much despite of all the sins that I've done. And the empty tomb reminds me that I too can be resurrected, that I too may be with him in heaven someday. And those things reminds me of the love and the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. And I took that choice. So the, the resurrection, the cross, and the empty tomb is a choice for you and I. You know, a choice to eternal life. Again, uh, just going back to our choice lesson, I mentioned that in choice there are normally two options. Okay, normally there are two options, at least two options. And one is better than the other. Okay, one is more advantageous than the other. Okay. That's why we must choose intelligently. You must use your God-given ability to choose properly, especially when it comes to matter of spirituality. Uh, the Bible uh, clearly tells us that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. And why would you like to be with the devil? Why would you like to be with the demons? For his purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. While on the other hand, Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, Jesus here is giving us an information. An information and also a comparison between him and his adversary, the devil. He came 
so that we may have life and notice not just an ordinary life, not just a simple life, but he said abundant life. And you have it abundantly. While on the other hand, he said the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. It is clear that Jesus is giving us a hint, you know, giving us a hint in which to side with. And he wants us to side with him. But the following verse that I will show you is clear that Jesus wants us to take his side and follow him. In the scripture reading read by Brother Tony, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many entered through it. But the small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life and only if you find it. Now, is Jesus giving us a suggestion or a command? Now, whichever way you look at it, right off the bat, Jesus is telling you to enter through the narrow gate. Jesus is asking you to enter through the narrow gate. Now, the question is, but why is that? Why is it that Jesus wants you and I to enter through the narrow gate? The answer, simply love. Jesus love you. That's why he wants you to enter through the narrow gate. The message behind Jesus telling us to enter the narrow gate is love. Jesus doesn't want you and I to be deceived. He told us already in John chapter 10, verse 10, the purpose of Satan, the purpose of the devil. He doesn't want you to be deceived. And Jesus knew that some were saying that there would be no resurrection. That there would be no, no resurrection of the dead. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead. For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. Because of Jesus' love for you and I, he doesn't want us to be deceived. Because there are so many claiming that there is no resurrection of the dead. That when we die, our soul will be annihilated, meaning it will cease to exist, but that is not the case. Jesus, through Apostle Paul, clearly said that there will be a resurrection. For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. That's why Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, he showed himself to so many people so that his claim of resurrection can be validated. Can be validated. Because many people saw him. So that no one will say, Jesus Christ never rose from the dead. And he did. That's why he showed himself to many witnesses. Now, read the story. I know you have heard the story of the rich man and Lazarus over and over again. Read the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. There you will see that a person's soul will not be annihilated. You will continue to exist in internal punishment or in eternal life and there is no crossing over in the afterlife there is no crossing over many are teaching a false hope why did i say that because i have sir i have heard many teachings that would say that even if you spend your life being a sinner in this world and if you die we will just pray for you. And when we pray for you, we can have so many people praying for you and then you can cross over. And that is totally not biblical. There is no such thing in the Bible that when a person dies, he could cross over from death to life. That's why Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate because I love you. 
I don't want you to be deceived. I want you to have an abundant life. An abundant life that is in heaven with me someday. That is the message of the cross. That is the message of Jesus' resurrection, the empty tomb. Now, right from the start, Jesus wants you and I to be with him. That's why he was pointing us to enter the narrow gate. Now, in Luke chapter 13, part of the scripture reading, there was a question to Jesus Christ. The question was, Lord, someone asked him, will only a few people be saved? Now, Jesus answered, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Now, if you will read this verse very carefully, only a few will be saved. Only a few. According to Jesus, you read Matthew 7 and you read Luke 13. Now, Jesus said many will try. Many will try entering the narrow gate, but will not able to do so. Will not be able to enter. Again, if you look carefully at the account of Matthew and the account of Luke, there is quite a, a, quite a difference in how the author presented it. Now, as we progress, you will see the difference. Okay. Now, let us see and go side by side with them and learn a few lessons. Now, first, we look into the words, enter the narrow gate according to Matthew. Now question, is the narrow gate easy or not? Is the narrow gate easy or not? Just a rhetorical question. And most probably, most people would answer, and you would probably answer, it's not easy. Okay. That would be the answer of many people. If you ask them, is the narrow gate easy or not? They will say, it is not easy. Why? Why is the narrow gate not easy? The answer would be because it is narrow. That's why it's not easy. Okay? But the question, another thing that I want to ask is, how narrow is the narrow gate? We don't know. How narrow is the narrow? Let me give you an example. If you look at that door, the main entrance at the back, the main entrance of this building, and if you, if you compare that main entrance to that door and that door okay, in front of you, which is narrow? These two, right? But you can enter and you can exit it easy, right? The same thing with that big door. So why is it we always say, people say that the narrow gate is not easy. Where in fact, those two doors are narrow, are narrower than that door. But they are both easy to access, easy to enter, and easy to exit. Okay. Now, another thing, let me tell you, that the narrow gate is not easy. I will tell you, the narrow gate is not easy. Why did I say that the narrow gate is not easy, despite the fact that I've shown you that even this narrow door here, the same like those at the back. Why is it that the narrow gate is not easy? Now, though the word narrow, by the way, is an idiom. It is an idiom that refers to hardship. Okay. Now, the account of Luke tells us, make every effort Strive, in other translation, strive, strive to enter the narrow door. Why did I say that the narrow door is not easy? The Greek word for strive is agonizomai. Agonizomai. It means agony, struggle, to contend for a price. Okay. So that's where we get our word agony. 
That's where we get our word agonize. Okay? So, though salvation is by grace, freely given by God, it doesn't mean there aren't any sacrifices or struggles on our part along the way in choosing Jesus Christ. There would be. That's why I said that the narrow gate is not easy based on the Luke account. Because Luke said, you strive. There would be struggle. And when you struggle, it's not easy. Okay? So that's why it is not easy. Now, Paul demonstrates this type of thing in an athlete in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Paul said, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. You know, just like that of an athlete, you know, where discipline is paramount, at most important. Now, in that discipline, there will be pain. Of course, there will be pain that must be endured and sacrifices that must be willing to go through. You must be willing to go through to all those troubles, to, to, to discipline and to train like an athlete. So there would be sacrifices along the way. Now in Philippians chapter 3, now Paul said, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press, I press on toward the goal to win the prize of God's heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. Now Paul used the word straining, straining toward, meaning stretching those muscles, you know, stretching, okay? like you're reaching. I don't want to overstretch. No, stretching those ligaments, okay? reaching forward to reach something what is ahead or what is spiritual. Now, when you do a standing or sitting toe touches, okay, when you do that, you are actually stretching the muscles, okay, your hamstring, your leg muscles, you are actually stretching it. And you are putting a strain. You are straining your muscles. And that is what Apostle Paul meant. When he said forgetting what is behind and straining, if you look into other Bible translation, Paul said reaching forward, okay? reaching forward until it becomes uncomfortable for you and I. And he said, I press on. Press meaning I will put up a fight. That is what Paul meant when he said, I press on toward the goal. I will put up a fight even if it hurts. Even if it hurts, I will give it a try. I will not stop. No. And that's what Paul meant when he said, forgetting what is behind and straining, reaching, always moving forward to what is ahead. I press on. I will never give up. I will put up a fight, even if it meant my life. You see, going through the narrow gate, <clears throat> it's not going to be easy. But I'm telling you, it is doable. And that is the best thing. Many are afraid. Of course, you will be afraid of pain. Many are afraid of pain. That's why many people does, doesn't want to go through the narrow gate because of the pain. But I'm telling you, it is doable. Now let's go back to Matthew 7. Enter to the narrow gate and the narrow way that leads to life. Now what is the essence of the narrow in terms of salvation? What is the essence? Now let me tell you about two important things about the word narrow. Number one, the other word used for narrow is straight straight and when you look up in the dictionary the word or the meaning straight a straight is a comparatively narrow passageway connecting two 
bodies of water. If this is one body of water, there would be one strait that would connect to the other bodies of water. Okay. From here, this life here on earth, we can only, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we can only be connected to eternity in heaven through the narrow gate. Let me repeat that. Our life here on earth, we can only be connected to heaven through the narrow gate. And who is the narrow gate? Who is in the narrow gate? Because the narrow gate leads to life. John chapter 10 verse 9. Yes, Jesus said, Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. That is an emphatic sentence or words by Jesus Christ. The only way for you and I to connect to heaven is through that straight, through that connecting narrow way from here on to eternity in heaven. Because Jesus is the gate, according to John chapter 10, verse 9. You cannot go to heaven without connecting to Jesus Christ. You cannot go to heaven, whatever you do, you cannot go to heaven without connecting to this straight, to this narrow straight, to this narrow door, because this is the only way, because Jesus is the gate. Now, second, the word narrow that I want to bring out comes from the Greek word stenos. Stenos, meaning short, small. That's where the word stenography comes from. The process of writing shorthand. Who knows how to do stenography? If you have taken a secretarial job or a secretarial course, you will know how to how to write stenography. Normally, they are in the uh, in the uh, clerk of court. Shorthand, not the long hand. Shorthand. Okay. Now, the meaning of this might be confusing to all of you, but let me explain it this way. Shorthand means easy. Wait a minute, Brother Mike. A while ago you said <laughs> that the narrow is not easy. And now it is easy. Okay. Now take it easy. I will explain it to you. <laughs> now, which is which? <clears throat> now, narrow, again, means small, short, you know, and uh, shorthand in writing. Okay. Though there may be sacrifices... Okay. Again, it won't be easy. I said it is doable. Doable. Now, salvation is not easy, but it is doable. This is the part where Jesus made it clear. Made it clear in his word that his yoke is what? His yoke is what? His yoke is easy. And his burden is what? His burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. To 30 and his commandments are what are not burdensome therefore it's easy now i have shown you two texts that the way of jesus is easy it's doable okay? now for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome okay now though the narrow gate it entails struggles. It will have sacrifices. It becomes easy along the way to a true servant of Christ because you are now enjoying, you are now enjoying your journey with God and have disciplined yourself to the instructions of God. You are now accustomed to your way of life. And when you are accustomed to your way of life, it becomes smooth sailing. It becomes 
easy. Therefore, entering through the narrow gate becomes now easy for you because you have been accustomed living with Christ. But at first, let me remind you, it will be difficult. There will be struggles. But along the way, because the word narrow means short, it means assured. Therefore, as you go along the way, your struggle will be less and less because you are now accustomed to living your life with Jesus Christ. That's why it becomes easy. His yoke, you will find it easy and you will find that his burden is light and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, just to prove to you that I am right, that, that it is easy in the narrow gate, let me ask all of you, just to prove my point that I am right, let me ask all of you, now that you are a Christian, now that you are serving Christ for so long, my question is, is it hard for you following Jesus? If you have been a Christian for so long, my question to you, is it hard for you now to follow Jesus? And I know your answer is no. It is not hard for you. It is easy for you. Therefore, I am right. That serving Christ is not hard. Can I get an amen? Can I get a louder amen? amen. Then I prove my point. It is not hard to serve God. Now, I want you to tell that to your friends who is not serving God. Tell them it is not hard to serve God. That is the point that I'm driving at. At first, there would be struggle. You know, finding hard to let go of our worldly and evil ways, you know, our worldly ways. But after that, following Jesus would be easy. It becomes easy. You know, the broad and wide way is long. It is not short. It is long. It is tedious and confusing way to navigate. Because it has many ways. When you go to that broad way, it has many ways. So confusing. The narrow way is short way. Straight. Therefore, not tedious and assured. Now, Matthew 7, 14 tells us, and only a few find it. Okay? Only a few find it. Only a few find it because the one who seek him must do so intentionally. Must do so intentionally. Now, in Jeremiah 19, 13, uh, 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Okay? Now, Luke 13, 24, it qualifies how seeking is done. If you will look carefully, Luke 13, 24, it qualifies, Jesus qualifies how seeking must be done. He said, strive. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter in and will not be able. You know, many will try to enter the narrow, but they will be denied. They will be denied though they seek it because they do not strive. They do not strive. The key word for seeking is the word striving. We must strive. They are not willing to let go of their old ways. There is no struggle. Jesus wants you to struggle. Jesus wants you to carry your own cross. For those people who want to go in, they will be denied because they don't want to struggle. They don't want to give up. No. They are not willing to take the yoke of Jesus and oftentimes, many people seek the Lord too late. Okay. Now, imagine for me for a, for a while. Imagine with me. You know, during the days of Noah, when the flood came, okay, when the flood came to them, the people would probably running towards the ark, you know, seeking entrance to the, to the ark. But Jesus said they will be, they will not be granted entry, because number one, they are not, they did not strive. At number two, they seek him late. Now notice in verse 25 to 27 of Luke chapter 13. 
It says, after the master of the house gets up and shuts the door, you will stand outside knocking and saying, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I do not know where you are from. Then will you begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evil doers. You see the master, the master of the house shuts the door. You are too late. You are too late. Now look again. People knew. People knew Jesus. They knew him. They knew the gospel. They said, Lord, open the door for us. You taught in our streets. They knew the gospel. They heard the gospel. But they never took Jesus Christ seriously. They never took the gospel seriously. A striving, my dear brethren and friends, is a strong desire for a relationship and service to God. It must be born in one man's heart if you are a true seeker and this is the essence of seeking god now jesus tells us in john chapter 17 verse 3 now this is eternal life that they know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent now our earnest desire of wanting to know god will definitely lead us to know god and this on the other hand is the essence of true life Striving, a strong desire for a relationship and service to God is the essence of seeking God. Knowing that is learning from God and obeying God <clears throat> is the essence of true life. A person must strive. A person must want the gospel. Now, my final question would be, why is the gate narrow? Why is it? Number one, because there is only one way. The gate is narrow. The gate is straight because there is only one way. John 14, 6 and Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Now, when Jesus said he is the way, then the other way is wrong. Correct? The broad way is wrong. When Jesus said he is the truth, then the others are wrong. The others are false. All the doctrines that contradict the Bible, they are wrong. There can be no other truth than Jesus and his word, the one that you are holding right now, the Bible. Now, Jesus said salvation is in no other name, but only in his name. Therefore, all other names claiming to be the Savior are wrong. Correct? They are wrong. Now, whether you accept this or not, it's all up to you. Again, as I've said earlier, it's our choice. It is either Jesus is lying or Jesus is telling the truth. It's your choice. There is no in-between. Because truth, by definition, is exclusive. It is exclusive. If truth were all-inclusive, then nothing would be false. If Jesus said that he is the way, that is the truth. That is the exclusivity of his word. And that is, by definition, the meaning of truth. When he said, I am the way, the truth and the life, all others claiming to be are false. Because truth, again, is exclusive. If salvation can be in whatever ways we want, then Jesus Christ and Christianity are useless. You know, we cannot have it our own way. You cannot have it your own way. Only Jesus' way. That's why the other way is broad, because people want it their own way. And that cannot be. When Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, because narrow is the gate that leads to life, therefore the broad way is false. Therefore, the broad way leads to destruction, and that is the truth, exclusive and absolute. Now, many people oftentimes, they say this, and I often hear this, you know, 
all are the same, brother Mike. We are all the same. We are all calling on the name Jesus. We are all worshiping the same God. That is what is important. We are just the same. Although we just do it differently. How can that be the same if we are doing it differently? Right? How can that be the same? Okay. You know, and they will say, you know, we will be saved. You are calling on to the name of Jesus. We are calling also to the name of Jesus. We are worshiping God. You are worshiping God. We are all the same. We just do it differently. In Matthew 7, 21, the Bible is clear. And Jesus is clear. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. It is clear that all who call upon the name of Jesus will be saved. Only the obedient ones. Now you see the word, those who do the will of my Father, that is obedience. It connotes obedience. Now Paul in his letter in Ephesians 5.6, 5, he puts it this way. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath becomes on those who are what? Disobedient. Not because you are calling and praying to God means you are assured of your salvation. No. Obedience is a must. Now remember the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 to 7. We will not read to it, but I will flash it to you. Okay. Remember that account? Okay. They both worship God. Okay. Abel did the right way. And Cain did not. He did not do it the right way. And he suffered for it. Okay. That is why it is, a wrong, it is a wrong connotation to say that we are just the same. I am calling upon Jesus. You are calling upon Jesus. I am worshiping God. You are worshiping God. But we are just doing it differently. That's not the same. As we have seen in the account of Cain and Abel. They knew what should be done. They knew how to offer the sacrifices. They knew how to worship God, but Abel did the right thing. But Cain did not. My point being, they both worship God. Correct? They both worship God. You read the account. But they did it differently. One was acceptable and one was not. Again, how can that be? We are the same if we are doing it differently. Jesus said there are just two ways. The narrow and the broad way. The narrow will lead you to life while the broad way will lead you to death. If one is right, therefore the other is wrong. Salvation is not, is not in your own way, but in God's way. How can you know the will of God? His purpose in your life and his salvation if you will not read the Bible. Many claim to be Christians, but they are not reading the good book. Many claim to be Christians, but they are not practicing the good book. How can that be? How can you grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ if you are not reading the very words of God? How can we say that we are Christians and yet we want to follow ourselves and don't want to follow Christ or we follow Christ but we want to do it ourselves you know that cannot be our ways to eternal life is only through the narrow gate through Jesus Christ for he is the gate the resurrection of Jesus only proves to all of us that, you, that he was resurrected and you will be also resurrected soon when we all get to heaven, when we breathed our last. And finally, let me lead, leave all of us with this word of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Again, Jesus said, I am. Empathic, I am. A claim he made because he is 
what they say he is. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. But there is a question. Do you believe this? I want to ask that question to all of us. Do you believe this? And to those who have not yet accepted the Lord, the question is, do you believe these words of Jesus Christ? If you believe that Jesus is God, the Son of God, resurrected from the dead, then you will believe His words and you will come today and accept Jesus, repent of your sins, and be immersed in water through baptism. Thank you, my dear brethren and friends, for listening. May God bless us all. The gospel is yours. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? Good morning. <laughs>